Welcome to A Matter of Perspective with Judge Derwin Webb. I am Judge Derwin Webb coming to you from the Fraser History Museum. You know, it's not often that we get a chance to talk to living legends on this show. Today we have one. We have my coach, Wade Houston. Coach Houston, welcome to our show. Thanks. Good to be here. Uh, we've been trying to get together for a while. I'm, I'm glad that we're able to do it today. Uh, we have a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, I told you before we got started that we only have about 30 minutes, but your life is not condensed to 30 minutes. So I uh, just want to ask you a few questions about uh, you being in Louisville, about life. Let's just talk about you and being at the University of Louisville. I know that you're from Tennessee and you were a highly sought after basketball player when you were at Tennessee. Uh, what made you think about the University of Louisville? And before I say that, it should be noted that you are one of the first three African-Americans to ever play for the University of Louisville. What went into your thought processes of coming to, to here to play basketball? Well, growing up in the South in the late 50s, early 60s, um, the schools around me were HBCUs, Tennessee State, uh, Knox, Knoxville College, and a few other HBCUs, uh, uh, even Texas Southern and Grambling. But I had, I had started to watch the NC2A games or college games on television, and I can remember watching Dayton, Michigan, Minnesota, St. Bonaventure were all schools that I, I watched growing up. And, but my plan was to go to Tennessee State. That's where a lot of my high school friends went, a lot of my guys I had played against. Uh, of course, the state tournaments at that time were all black. The, the uh, schools weren't integrated when I came through. So Tennessee State was like the hot name. It was the name where uh, Skull Barnett, a lot of guys who had gotten to the pros, Coach McClendon had been there. So that was my choice. My choice was, was to go to Tennessee State. And then all of a sudden, we're starting to win big, and as a high school team, uh, Alcoa, Tennessee, where I grew up, which is near Knoxville, had a lot of players, uh, influx of players coming in, families working at the aluminum company, the Alcoa Aluminum Company. And we got, we were getting bigger, we were getting better, and we started getting national publicity. And a guy who uh, ran the post office there was a good friend of my college coach, Coach Peck Hickman. And he recommended to Coach Hickman that he send somebody down to, to watch us play in the regional tournament in Knoxville. And he came down and saw us play. And he thought I was good enough. And we had two other guys on our team. My brother went to Cincinnati. A guy named Tommy Woods went to East Tennessee State. So we had five guys on our team who went to Division One. So when he came down and asked me to come up for a visit, I did that. Enjoyed my visit. Went out to Freedom Hall, which was probably the third largest indoor arena in the world behind uh, the Cow Palace in San Francisco and Madison Square Garden. And I was just blown away by Freedom Hall and just uh, the fact that I have a chance to play in a place like that. So when they originally approached you and said that you, we'd like for you to consider coming to the University of Louisville, um, there weren't people that looked like you at the University of Louisville, especially on the basketball team. I know that Charlie Johnson was around and uh, people like that, but as far as basketball was concerned, there was, wasn't anyone that looked, that looked like you. So tell me about your recruiting visit and, and, and being introduced to some of your uh, potential teammates. Right. Well, again, uh, I was the first to sign. I signed that May of 1962 after my senior year. And later on that summer, Eddie Whitehead signed and, and then Sam Smith. I don't know if it's, that was the order for, for the two of them. But when I came here for the visit, the football players were guys who just showed us around and, and hosted us. And guys like Lenny Lyles, Ernie Green, uh, and other African-American football players were already here and, and had been here since the uh, mid-50s and the late 50s. Mm -hmm. So um, they, were, they were very gracious with, 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 with hosting us, but at the same time you could tell that it hadn't been, hadn't been a great experience because in the late 50s, you know, segregation in most places was still very, very prevalent. So, but, but they, were, they could see the changes coming and, and they were... Uh, they freely expressed what they had been through, and, and they said that it was uh, an experience, that they, uh, it, it wasn't bad for them. So, so as I learned more about the university, I met some people in the community. From, uh, the Mammoth Life Insurance was a big insurance company here owned by, by African Americans. Um, and there were other, other uh, African American business people who worked at uh, uh, Philip Morris and places like that. So I was convinced that 
there was enough here for me to want to come through the business world and also through the experiences that the other football players have had. So you sign, you decide to come, you get to University of Louisville, you're on campus, you're a student, you're away from home for the first time uh, in this type of a setting. What, what was it like being a student at the university at the, during that time? Um, the, the campus life was, was, was pretty good. Uh, the, the, only, the biggest challenges we had is, is when we travel, especially on the freshman team. On the, and the freshman team, during that time, freshmen could not play varsity. So we had our own freshman schedule. And, and we would travel to uh, different uh, junior colleges, freshman teams throughout the state of Kentucky and other schools in the area. And that's where, that's where we faced uh, some, of, some of the name calling, some of the treatment that some of the fans in those locations but getting through that, the first part of that season, it was good. But then I, I remember going home and after the first five games, we were off for Christmas and getting on the Greyhound bus, leaving to go to Knoxville from Louisville. And uh, that, the experience of getting on that bus and stopping at some of the small towns between, between here and Knoxville was something I had not expected. So. Uh, and, and it, I, I was just un, so unsure of what it was like. So I just stayed back in the corner of the bus, uh, got off once to use the restroom, and was hoping that there was no other experiences that might come about between on that bus ride between Louisville and Knoxville. And that was the first time I thought about where I was and if I was in the right place. And, and when I got home, I was telling my dad, I said, you know, I, the bus ride just really bothered me. And, and he told me, he said, well, he said, well, if that's all, that has happened to you since you've been gone, he said, you're going back to school. He said, the bus ride, it could have been a lot worse. It, you know, when I grew up and when, when your uncles grew up, he said, we had to go through a whole lot more than a bus ride where people were looking at you and, and potentially treating you a certain way. So, so that talk from my dad really, really helped me. And so then the next thing, of course, was traveling with the varsity team. And I later found out that our coaches would call ahead for us and make sure that the places we stayed would accept us, that restaurants we, uh, we ate at would, would be good for us. And the biggest, the biggest city or the biggest situation that we faced was probably New Orleans. And in New Orleans, it was just like the racism and, and the things from the people there just kind of hit you in the face. Um, so, Is there a particular thing that happened, a particular instance? Yeah, just, that just restaurant, you know, people shutting the door, see us coming, you know, we, walk, we, we walked on Bourbon Street and, and, and Bourbon Street, you saw a lot of risque kind of things going on in the bar. So we said, hmm, I, as a 17, 18 year old, I never say anything like that. So it's still the same, by the yeah, way. <laughs> yeah. So, so we walk down, we see a place, you know, they had like these swinging doors on some of the restaurants, you know. So we walk and, and uh, we just kind of make a turn toward those doors and bam, like the door, you have to duck out of the way because the doors will hit you and come back. So, so we knew at that time that we had to go back and just stay in our, get in our hotel room to stay there. And uh, we knew we weren't welcome in some of the establishments there on, on Bourbon Street. And, and probably good for us. We probably didn't need to be there anyway. But, mm -hmm. but uh, <clears throat> from that point on, we went to Missouri Valley. Missouri Valley was Bradley, Drake, uh, Cincinnati, uh, Tulsa, uh, Wichita. And, and in those cities, uh, it, they were pretty progressive. You know? so, mm -hmm. so it wasn't like we had a league in the SEC or places like that in the South. In, in the early 60s where we knew we were going to face those, those kind of situations. So being in the Missouri Valley and having our coaches call ahead of time for us, and, and uh, which, as I said, I found out later was big. And, and, it, and it meant a lot to me uh, when I found this out, knowing that our coaches were looking out for us before we went to certain places. Was there anything that stood out to you? Like, for example, being, uh, I, you know, of course, I've read about the civil rights movement. Uh, was not born during that time, but you actually lived it. Uh, is there anything that stands out to you that you can discuss that uh, would help us to understand what it was like for you as a student during the civil rights movement? Um, well, the biggest event during that time for me and for uh, my, my two other players on the team was going to Frankfurt in 1964 to hear uh, Dr. Martin Luther King speak. And, you know, again, growing up in the South, you know, some of the, some of the students there were, were participating in the lunch counter sit-ins. Uh, they, were, they were involved in the, in the marches. 
Um, so, so coming here in the 60s, it was just learning. You know, you, you're learning about the assassination of, of John F. Kennedy and you're learning what's going on in the civil rights world. But we heard that Dr. King was going to be speaking in Frankfurt. So we drove to Frankfurt in the spring, maybe April of 1964. And being the big guys that we were, an aggressive guy, we, we worked our way all the way up to the front of the line. And we were maybe three or four rows from hearing him speak. And, and there was Mahalia Jackson, Harry Belafonte, uh, Jackie Robinson. Wow. And, and to hear the speeches and to hear some of the experiences they had was just, was like, uh, it, was, it was a life changing experience for me. And then to know that the, he had been through some of the things he had been through as, as a civil rights leader. So, so I just understood at the time that, that you know, you, what I've been through was like minor compared to some of the being put in jail and being having to go on through some of the things that, that those people had gone through. So, but that one experience was, was eye-opening for me and just helped me get a perspective on what the civil rights movement was really about. Let's fast forward. You, you play basketball at the university, you graduate and you decide to play professional basketball in France. Can you talk about the difference between the United States and your new found home in France? Yeah, and, and, and the biggest thing that I found in France was that you had to answer questions from, from the other French players, the other French people on why are you treated like that in the United States? You know, they, they would always come up to me and, and to Alice, my wife Alice was with me at the time. And, and when we had a discussion, sit down at the dinner, they said, we, we don't understand how, you know, people can, can put police dogs on you, how they, people can be lynched simply because of the color of the skin. And it hit me initially because I didn't have an answer. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to intellectualize on what I want to say about how all that stuff happened. But eventually, you know, I'm just starting to read more and to understand more. Um, and, and then later on, you know, I kind of reversed the question because they had people coming in from the islands that, that they had colonized and from Africa. And so you had the same situation to some degree, but, but they hadn't been around those people as much. So they, they leaned on me and asked me questions about how, how does it feel? You know, what's it like? Um, so so I, had to, I had to start to think right away and come up with answers about what it felt like you know, having that experience in the, and going up in the South because they were really just concerned about how that all took place. Now I'm thinking back to uh, some people I've talked to in the past, some people that uh, were raised during that time period. And I had a pleasure of talking to a gentleman that decided uh, to go over to Europe. He was going over there for a year, I think, to study, uh, left the United States, went to Europe, and he didn't come back for a long time mm -hmm. uh, because he loved it over there. He felt like he was uh, treated well. Uh, he felt like he was accepted. What made you want to come back? Yeah. I had a chance to go to graduate school, and that was my primary focus. Uh, uh, and and Alan, um, Alan was born in uh, in April, and uh, I couldn't I couldn't leave that following year because he had to be I think uh, a year old before I could take him because of all the vaccinations and mm -hmm. those kind of things. So so I wasn't going to leave him, but but here again I had a chance I had a chance to go to graduate school, which I did. Um, but a, a lot of American entertainers and professionals went to France, you know, and. and um, mm -hmm. I guess some went to England, some went to Germany, but France seemed to be the melting pot for a lot of lot of African Americans who were, felt they were mistreated here, and they didn't come back because the people there treated them very well. Mm -hmm. So um, it just—I mean, you you just see all—it was like a melting pot of people when you got when I got there in '70 and '71. You know, you see you saw people of all colors, all races, all just just living together, mingling together. And um, to their credit, I mean, it wasn't anything like the, like the, the, the South in the 60s and the 50s and 40s here in the United States. So I think that was one reason that there was a matriculation of American entertainers and, and athletes, uh, especially soccer uh, and then other entertainers that went to France and, and made that their home. Well, let me ask you this. I, I know that you obviously played professional basketball and you were very successful over there, decided to go to grad school, came back. What made you get involved in coaching? You know, I, I hadn't planned to get involved in coaching. When I, when I graduated from U of L, um, my assistant coach at the time was a guy by the name of John Dromo. And, 
and and I didn't know at that point that he was setting up interviews for me at uh, the different companies in Louisville and, and different uh, uh, professional opportunities. And uh, he just he thought that would have been a good good path for me to take versus coaching. So then I, when I graduated, I'm still playing. I'm still playing AAU basketball, which at that time was like professional ball. We had these teams that sponsored us, like Marathon Oil and uh, the beer companies and all of that. So we started to travel, and we were winning like these regional championships. We go to Detroit and play. We go to Toledo, places like that. And then um, as I played, you know, my, I got stronger and older, and I'm getting better. And then my friend comes to me and says, you know, there's an opening in France. One of my guys left. And uh, so I'd really like you to go with me to go back. So, so uh, go back to France. He had to come back to, from France to here. So, so when I went over there and, and, and I continued playing, then when I came back, um, I, was, I was just coaching. I wasn't coaching. I was playing in those AAU circuits. And I said, you know, I'm enjoying these kids. And I, I just got... Uh, Got to the point where I was offered jobs when I got out of out of uh, out of college, and I did my student teaching, and I enjoyed the teaching. So I said, I'll just I can go back into business at a later time. I told my coach that he was still upset because I didn't. He had a <laughs> uh, A and P uh, food chain was was right. a big chain at the time, and he had set up an interview, and they'd offer me a job, and uh, and I also went back down to Alcoa where I was from, and they offered me a job at the Alcoa Aluminum Company. And those were kind of trailblazing jobs at the time. So, mm -hmm. and I think he wanted me to step into that role versus into the coaching role. So, but once you get caught up in that coaching and you start having some success doing it, I mean, it's hard to get out of it. So, tell me about some of your best players. Who were some of the best players you coached? Uh, beside yourself, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I'm talking about high school. High school. Oh, high school. <laughs> yeah. I know you coached over at Mel High School. Yeah, I, I did. I did. And, and uh, of course, uh, at Mail, well, actually at, at Aaron's. My first school was at Aaron's, mm -hmm. and um, we we actually um, had some guys there at Aaron's that were like six five, six six guys. One guy played with a glow trotter. One guy went to Ohio State, Anthony Hall, and we started making noise at Aaron's High School, and uh, was playing like Mail and Manuel. And you know, Manuel had Philip Bond, Mail had Wester Cox and the Buntons, and and those, and, and so. Uh, so Keith Humphrey, uh, Don Miller, Anthony Hall were at at, at, uh, at Aaron's, and then when I got the mail, of course, uh, the, the team I had with Daryl Griffith and Bobby Turner and Jeff Mack, uh, Kevin God, Anderson. Jeff Mack was on that team. Yeah, yeah Jeff Mack was on that team. I mean, we go we go like ninety and twelve in three years at Mail High School, and uh, I, I had. Uh, I had never been around a group of athletes like that, and we, and we went ten deep. You know, the guys like uh, Victor Yarbrough, whose whose two sons now have this have this uh, uh, the Bro Brothers uh, Distillery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So their father played for me at Mill, and uh, Sweet Jones Braxton. So, but obviously, you know, you know, Daryl and Bobby and Jeff were the three guys, and and there were nights on the floor when you couldn't separate the three of them. I mean, they were they were just that good, and uh, so on the high school level. You know, I'd have to say, you know, Daryl, of course, had just great talent. Bobby was just tough as nails. I mean, Bobby Turner was just a guy who's people were afraid of him. You know, when they walked on the court, you know, they, he just he's the nicest guy you ever want to meet you know, in life. You know, and and then Jeff Mack, of course, who was like 6'1", 195, um, just really, really good player. Tore his knee up his, his senior year. So, so those three guys were as good as they came. So you decide to go to the University of Louisville to coach there. Talk, talk about the difference between, well, not the difference between, talk about transitioning from high school basketball to being an assistant coach. What, what was it like for, for you? Um, I just saw a need. I saw, I saw a niche. You know, I knew when Coach, when coach Crum came in, I mean, I would watch the team and, of course, I, just a huge fan and watched them in 72 with Price and Bacon and those guys in 72 and Vilcek and uh, – and then 75 with Junior and Alan Murphy and those guys. I'm, I'm, I'm glued to the television uh, when, when they're playing. So then, uh, you know, it was just like, you know, what, what needs to be done for that team? You know, what does Coach Crum need? So, so for me, it was finding a niche, which, which I thought was expanding um, 
recruiting from the city of Louisville. See, most of the, a lot of those, so many of those guys were from the city of Louisville, which was a base of, of all our really good teams. But then we started getting fielders from, from New York and Chicago and, you know, Larry Williams and Scoot, Rodney and Scooter and then down south Wiley and Lancaster and Charles Jones. And I'm going down to watch these guys play, you know, once I decide that we got a chance to expand our recruiting. And that's what it was. It was the fact that I think I saw a niche in the, uh, and what was needed here, and also just trying to com tie, tie the community into into the university too, and and our our fan base, particularly our African American fan base, was was unheralded. I mean, I don't all the places we went, we went everywhere throughout the country playing, and, and I could I just kind of intentionally look around to see who the fans were in different different arenas and different big time programs, but none of them rivaled our fan base, and and so many of them came from the West End and from from all over. But but the West End of Louisville, as we talked about this morning, and that dedication for Daryl Griffith on the on the street naming, was just a special place. And so then you started getting, you know, the players from the West End, you know, and and that just that made a big difference too. Our following was great. So you win a championship in '80, win a championship mm -hmm. in '86, uh, have some other teams that go further further along, and uh, and as you are, you know, expanding your uh, your your coaching resume, other teams are starting to look at you to become a head coach. How tough was it for you to leave the University of Louisville uh, to take another position somewhere else? Well, the, the thing that solidified it for me was that we started an organization called the Black Coaches Association. And that organization was formed by five of us, five assistant coaches who had gotten a lot of feelers about being a head coach, but, but but when we got to the finish line, you know somebody else was already always ahead of us. You know, mm -hmm. so 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 we're saying that you know, you know we can't tell a university or a search committee who to hire, but at least you know give us a chance to get to get in, into uh, that search committee's group of potential candidates, and and it just happened over and over again. So when we started this organization. We had John Thompson, who was, who was at, at Georgetown, Harry Edwards, who was at uh, Cal Berkeley, mm -hmm. to meet with us. And they told us that what you guys are doing is admirable, but what you have to understand is because, you know, you're really shaking some things up in this profession. He said, you might never get a job. You might be blackballed as an assistant coach and never get a job as a head coach. So we said, you know, well, so be it. You know, if, if, uh, if a nephew or a cousin or some young assistant coach now is offered a chance to get an interview because of what we're doing, then, then we've done our job. So, so that was what was happening with, with – there were only like four or five black head coaches. You had John Thompson, you had Larry Finch, you had John Chainett at Temple. Uh, Clem Hastings, I think, had gone to Minnesota at that time. So you maybe had five black head coaches, George Raveling maybe at Washington. And everywhere else you had black coaches who were who were recruiters. They were recruiters, you know, they were whenever somebody got in trouble, you know, they, they call us in and, and and do all those things. And and uh, so we said, no, you know, it's it's time for us to, you know, get an opportunity to become a head coach. So so that's what happened. And then at, at, at Tennessee, very unique uh, circumstance because the uh, the president at, of the university at the time was a guy named Lamar Alexander, who who later on ran for Ran for, ran for president, and then uh, Lamar, uh, my grandparents worked for Lamar, raised him from a child. So my grandparents worked for the Alexander family. So when my name came up, uh, I wasn't the first choice at Tennessee. They had uh, uh, Jack Kennedy from Iona, I can't think of his first name, Leonard Hamilton, and, and Lamar stepped in, you know, who my grandparents had worked for, and said, no, I said, we're gonna bring Wade in and give him a chance. So when I went in, did a good job with the interview, and uh, uh, from that point on, you know, I, I think uh, they were going to give me a special opportunity because, uh, you know, and, and Alan was a whole part of that thing, which you know he determined. Of course, y'all were about the same time, Darren. You know, you and Alan. So Alan told me. I, I asked Alan. I said, Alan, I said, what you know, what are we going to do with it? He said, he said, he said, I don't, you know, I like Louisville, but he wouldn't say. And he ended up talking to. Uh, some of the guys, you know, I don't know if he talked to you, but he talked to Purvis and Griff and all of them. And they said, if you got a chance to go and play for your dad, he said, you better pack your stuff and get out of here tomorrow. So, <clears throat> so that's how that kind of went down, even though the NC2A came in and they were saying, well, now nah. he said, well, I'm going. He said, that's, this is where we're going to be, keep our family together. And it was the best thing because 
it gave my parents a chance to, to watch him play, you know, my uncles and aunts. And after every game, they had their own section, you know. So it, it was so great to, for my parents to walk up after that game and have a chance to watch him play and just spend time with him. So, so that's sort of how it evolved. Well, I know you're the first African-American to coach in the SEC. Yeah. Uh, Tennessee was great. You know, you went home basically for that as well. But how cool was it to coach your son? It was it was great. And as I alluded to just a second ago, it was, you know, when you're out recruiting for so much time, which is what I was doing at UofL, I mean, I'm on the road all the time. I mean, I don't get a chance to spend time with him. So now all of a sudden, not only do I have a chance to coach him, but we got a chance to do all the things that a father and son could do. So. So, I mean, from the time he was nine years old, I mean, I was, we were 1980, we were win, winning the championship. Even he was six, seven years old, I'd see him at camp. But after that, you know, I'm, I'm hitting the road going because they didn't have the restrictions at that time mm -hmm. on how many times you could go out. So now all of a sudden, as I think about it, you know, on Sundays, you know, he coming home, we're playing ping pong, we go, we, we, we go play golf, we go to church, we do all the things that a father and son are supposed to do. So. So I, I would, I'd have to bite my tongue because I'd hear people say, well, why would you take your son? You know, I said, well, wh who am I going to give him to? I said, he's my son. You know, I'm not going to give my son to somebody else. And they get, we got a chance to keep our family together. So, mm -hmm. so that was a big part of, of how that whole thing evolved. But, uh, and then just to see the, the, the family togetherness, you know, became more than basketball. And, and he exuded all expectations, I thought, in basketball, you know, well, four years in a row, and he could have come out after three years, mm -hmm. and uh, and gone to the NBA. But he was just a, he was a home guy, you know. He just wanted to be home with family, and and we spent so much quality time together. Right. A um, couple more questions. Um, so you decide to stop coaching, and you go into business. You run very successful companies. What is it like being a businessman now? You know what. The thing I uh, recognized uh, initially was that, especially after we grew our companies and we were blessed to uh, to do a lot of work with Ford Motor Company. The thing I the thing I saw was that you you really have a chance to affect more lives because at one time we had about twenty five hundred uh, employees, maybe maybe two thousand truck drivers, and. In that in that industry, you know, it's kind of a, a good old boy industry. You know, and we were excluded uh, African American uh, terminal managers, uh, people who did all the things that were just really good jobs, good paying jobs. So we promoted terminal managers, we promoted uh, uh, drivers to uh, to lead the company. So to to have a chance to affect that many lives and, and coaching, you you have 15 guys, you might lose three a year. And you stay in touch with them, but now you got you got people that that you across the spectrum, maybe from Canada to Mexico. I mean, we I traveled to to Mexico to meet with Bombardier and hauling the skidoos and seedoos. I I traveled to Mexico about the trucks coming out of Mexico, and then we had 36 terminals throughout the United States. So now all of a sudden, you know, I got people all over that I got a chance to counsel and to coach and to, you know so. So it made a big difference, that transition from coaching a fewer number of people and mentoring a fewer number, number of people to, to 2,500. Well, there's one thing that, that can be said is that you cannot be put in a box. You can't be called just a coach. I call you yeah. Coach Houston because yeah. you were my coach, but you can't be put in a box. You can't be called just a business person. Uh, you're, you're a dad. You're a dad. Uh, you are a mentor to people. If you were writing a book about yourself, and you wanted to know, you wanted people to know who you were. How would you describe yourself? Well, you know, I, it, I'm I'm learning every day, even at my age. And and uh, I was on a Zoom call with with Alan a couple of days ago with several um, leaders in New York City of young people and trying to make a difference in their lives. Guys from the Bronx, from Brooklyn, Staten Island, Queens, Harlem. And we're talking about how we can make a difference and that, through Alan's uh, foundation. And I go into a chat room with one of the groups I, and I'm listening. I said, you guys are doing some great things. I mean, they had a guy who had been in prison for 30 years who came out and he dedicated his whole life to how he can improve and mentor these people. I said, well, look, I said, tell me this. I said, I, I want to help. I said, what, what can I do to help? I said, I don't, these young kids now are, are different. I said, I don't talk like them. I don't dress like them. And one, and one guy in that chat room said, Coach, he said, here's what you have to understand. 
He said, all you have to do is be there. He said, you don't have to dress like them. You don't have to have to have to uh, talk like them. But if you're a person of integrity, a person of decency, all they want you to do is be there and be there for them when they need just to ask you a question or just put your arm around the shoulder. So so that's the thing. You know, I, I mean, I just want to be there, you know, where you can help and, and just understand that I'm not going to necessarily talk or, or to address you know, to that to that extent but but still how can i help and and that's what we try to do with with the uh, sport and learning center with with the urban league down in the west end we just be there and provide as what we could with resources and just our time so so just helping just trying to be there and do the right thing you know i i do have to tell a funny story real quick i don't know if i ever expressed it to you you were you alluded earlier about uh, Allen and his decision to go to University of Tennessee and mm -hmm. talking to some other players about what he should do and what they told him. Um, he never talked to me, but I probably would have encouraged him to go as well because Allen and I played the same position. <laughs> and had he stayed here, I probably would have never seen the floor. So, so, so I appreciate you, you, you wanted to take that opportunity to take your son with you to, to another university. No, you, you'd have got some playing time because he had been trying to avoid you and when you guarded him. <laughs> Coach, I, yeah. I, you know, I, I talked to some of my other uh, teammates. I talked to Everick. Mm -hmm. Everett Sullivan, talked to Jerome Harmon, uh, talked to a lot of the guys that uh, were on the team with me, some guys that were here before me, and I talked to them about you coming uh, on, on this show. Uh, they all wanted me to tell you thank you. Okay. Uh, I will tell you this. Personally, I want to say thank you, too. Uh, not for going to the University of Tennessee and taking <laughs> your son with you. No, but I want to, take, I want to say thank you because I, I know that I am resting on your shoulders without – Coach Houston, there wouldn't be a Jerome Harmon. There wouldn't be a Purvis Ellis. And there wouldn't be a Derwin Webb. So thank you for opening the door and, 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 and paving the way for us to come through that door. Uh, I heard someone say that uh, he was drinking from a well that he never dug. Thank you for digging the well for us, man, because we would not be the people that we are without you. Uh, I remember uh, being recruited by Bobby Dotson, mm -hmm. and uh, you had a part in that as well. But when when I got here, Coach Dyson had left, mm. and I was torn up about it uh, because he was the one person that connected me to the university. But I remember one thing: my father said to me, "Coach Dyson may be gone, but I don't, I don't, I don't care about Coach Dyson. Coach Houston's a good man. You stick close to Coach Houston. If he tells you to do something, you just do it because he's he he'll be your dad away from home." Yeah. I want to thank you, man, for being my dad. Uh, you were there for me when I first got here. I was kind of this shy kid that um, kind of st stuck to myself. Good athlete, but just kind of stuck to myself. But you kind of helped me try and figure some things out my first year. So I, I want to say thank you, not only on my behalf, but thank you from the other players that wanted to say something for, to you as well. Well, I just have to add that I admire what, you, what you've done, Dee, and, and you, you've blazed a trail for a lot of young, young guys. and. And uh, the way you've carried yourself, and you know, someone that's always been there, and, and I could I could just point to is what you've done in your in your career. So a lot of athletes just don't take advantage of, of what they have, where they where they've come from, and you've done that, and that, that's where we are Thank today. You. Like the, whether it's the degree completion program that we, that we that we always work on, but but you're such a mentor. A lot of guys who play and they, and they forget why they're really here because they, you know, they're not all going to the NBA. So, but you're you're an example of that, and I appreciate you doing well, that. Well, I learned it from someone, so I, I'd say thank you. I appreciate yeah, okay. that. Uh, it, like, like we always like to close the show, uh, we always talk about the things we have done, things we want to do. At the end of the day, it's not a matter of what I say. It's not a matter of what you think. Always at the end of the day. It's all a matter of perspective. Coach Houston, thank you for being on the show and thank you for what you do for us. Thank you.